Hi there, and welcome to another edition of Aspiral CPA. Uh, today we're talking about when should I incorporate? And I have uh, Yahweh with me here again. Uh, so Yahweh, how many days we got before the end of uh, T4 filing deadline? We're, we're coming right oh, up on it, okay? Yeah, three, three more days. Three more days, we're gonna get it done. So, um, but the, the quote that I have, you know, regarding to when should I incorporate, it's uh, from Zig Ziglar, and it says, if you got the wrong plans, I don't care how many positive qualities you got, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Um, you know, the statistic here is that we have, you know, the highest personal rate in Alberta is 48% and the small business rate is a fantastic 11% and you can only capitalize on that if you're incorporated. And the story is business owners, they often end up paying more tax than it would cost them, you know, the extra cost to incorporation. Uh, you know, they avoid corporate incorporating because of the extra costs and in it, they end up paying more tax then it would actually cost them to incorporate. So Yahweh, what do you think are the questions that these business owners should be asking when deciding to incorporate? Well, first of all, um, what is another term for un unincorporated businesses and how do they file taxes? Yeah, so the other alternative to an unincorporated business, it's a proprietorship. And the proprietorship, uh, you know, uh, unincorporated business proprietorship means the same thing. They file the taxes in conjunction with their personal return. Mm -hmm. So it's a schedule, the T2125 Statement of Business of Professional Income, and it's an extra schedule to your personal tax return. Um, that's essentially how they uh, they file taxes. You know, we normally use single entry accounting, which just gets the totals in various categories by the client and, and go through them with them on you know what's deductible, what's not, are we missing anything? But it's it's relatively a simplistic process, and, and it, it's it done in conjunction with the filing of their personal taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the main advantage of unincorporated businesses? Yeah, um, you're hard pressed to find you know too many advantages. The, the main one is that it's cheaper, mm -hmm. so it's cheaper to do the work for uh, you know for an unincorporated business. Like I said, it's just a schedule on your personal tax return. We're normally just looking at uh, totals in various categories that have been prepared by the business owner. You know, with our guidance, we give them the categories and they prepare the total, they, you know, calculate the totals in each of those categories. So total revenue, mm -hmm. total advertising expense, total office supplies, you know, total uh, travel expense. And, and, and we work with them to find the, the right deductions and, and make sure there's nothing missing. But it's, it's a relatively simplistic process mm -hmm. than going through the, the incorporation process and doing formal financial statements, you know, corporate tax return, T4s and T5s. Uh, personal tax return and some tax planning as well. Right. Um, what aspect of CPP surprises most unincorporated business owners? Yeah, so we go back to the tax rates. The you know highest personal rate is forty eight percent. You know, and your rates go up until you hit the highest bracket. Uh, and usually, you know, business owners are pretty sophisticated. They go online, they start looking at how much I'm making and what are the tax brackets on that income, and they come up with something. And then they're completely blindsided by CPP. Mm -hmm. So they have to pay their tax, but once you're operating an unincorporated business, you have to pay CPP as well. So the same CPP you paid as an employee, now you're paying both the employee and the employer contribution. Mm -hmm. So if you if you you know ever had a job and you had CPP deducted off your check and you paid you know twenty six hundred bucks in CPP, roughly for the year as the maximum. You know, as soon as you're uh, running your own business and your proprietorship, you not you don't just have to pay that employee portion, that twenty same twenty six hundred bucks. You got to pay the employer portion too, which is another twenty six hundred bucks. So you know, and approximately you know fifty two hundred dollars in addition to that tax that you so meticulously calculated, and that's usually what they're blindsided by is that extra fifty two hundred bucks, and there's no way around it unless you're incorporated. Okay. Um, at what profit level do the tax benefits of incorporating normally outweigh the cost? Yeah, there are some secondary considerations which we'll, we'll get into here too, but you know, the first thing is we just look at it, is, is this cheaper? Is it just cheaper for you to be incorporated or not? And you know, there's some considerations, but I, I put a general rule out there and you know, uh, the disclosure, this is the general rule, doesn't work in every situation, but um, if you have $50,000 of income, and that's income before you pay yourself as the owner of the business. So after you've collected your revenue, paid your business expenses, and you have $50,000 or more of income left over, you should really look at the being incorporated. You're starting to get in that neighborhood of you're paying you know, tax plus $5,200 of the CDP. $5,200 can go a long way in a new business. Yeah. 
um, in terms of what you can what you can do with it. Um, so I would say, you know, at, at about fifty thousand bucks, normally the spreadsheet is going to tell us that it was actually cheaper for you to be incorporated, even considering the uh, you know the extra uh, cost of maintaining that corporation once you factor in the tax savings. Okay. Um, how does incorporating help protect your personal assets? So you're you have what's called a limited liability uh, once you're operating through a corporation, and it, it's not absolute. Uh, but what that means is you're conducting business in a separate legal entity. So if that business, you know, creates a loss or damages and, and, and it gets sued, they're suing that business. They're suing the assets inside of that business. And it's much more difficult for them to get to the, the business owners and specifically, well, they can really never get to the shareholders. It's, mm -hmm. Can they get to the directors of the business? In a small business, usually the shareholders and directors are the same. Uh, but can they actually, you know, get to the directors personally? It's not that they can't. It's just extremely unlikely that they can. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you make a mistake in your business, you know, it, it, if something happens, you, you, uh, if you get sued and there's a damage, you know, they're looking at the assets in the business, not at your personal assets. And, you know, people sometimes think that, you know, I don't have any risk. You know, it, is, it is never zero. It's never zero. So it's just, you know, it's, it, it, and if you think it's zero, you're not thinking broad enough because, you know, have you ever gotten to a car to drive to anywhere for your business? Well, guess what? You could have, you could have got sued for that mm -hmm. um, in conducting the business. So even if you know, maybe you're a graphic designer and that's really kind of low risk as opposed to maybe a plumber who can cause a big leak in a building. That's really high risk type of thing. Um, but you know, we look at what that risk factor is, and it's never zero. You have to be honest with yourself. There's always something that can happen, even if it's just driving the car. Okay. Um. <coughs> Does registering a trade name offer the same protection as incorporating? Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't claim to be a, uh, a trademark lawyer, but everyone that I've ever uh, went to, and every time we get advice on this from a client, it always comes back the same way, is if you want to protect a trade name, you should incorporate that name. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, registration that you file at corporate registries, it's more of a placeholder. Um, so, you know, people think that they go and they pay their 20 bucks or 40 bucks of corporate registries and they register a trade name for their unincorporated business and that gives them a legal right to it. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, we've been recommended to us on several occasions that if you want to protect that, go and incorporate that name because that person who goes and incorporates over top of that trade name, now they have the legal right to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and not the person who registered the trade name. So if you want to have a legal right to that business, you know, that trade name, you want to incorporate it. So if that trade name means anything to, you know, that's a consideration of when you should incorporate. Okay. Um, how can incorporating help you get WCB coverage in Alberta? Yeah, so we run into this trap sometimes, uh, a lot of it in the construction industry, but it can be in other industries as well, is WCB you know, in Alberta, they basically have a policy that they want to issue the coverage to who they call the prime contractor. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're not working for the end user themselves. So on a construction project, for example, you know, you're not working for the homeowner, you're working for a general contractor and the general contractor has a relationship with the customer and you work for the general contractor. Uh, WCB will take the position that, that that general contractor is the prime contractor, which, and they'll say that you are ineligible for WCB coverage as uh, the uh, subcontractor. And you know, this can happen on a, uh, Suncor site or, or whatever you're happy. Let's say Suncor should get your WCB and Suncor turns around and tells you we're not going to give you the job unless you get WCB coverage. So the way around it is you incorporate. Once you incorporate, WCB has it written administratively into their policies that they'll give you the WCB number and they won't query who's the prime contractor anymore. So sometimes it's just a necessary evil in order to get WCB coverage in Alberta. Um, will banks issue business loans to unincorporated businesses? Uh, I don't want to say it's impossible. I just want to say I've never seen it. So um, the, I've never seen a real, uh, any you know, loan of any substance you know, other than maybe a, a credit card that's branded to the, to the company. You know, nothing of any really high value that's going to be issued. So if you need to get a business loan of, of almost you know, any significance whatsoever, you're going to want to incorporate because the bank or other lending institution is going to insist that uh, you're incorporated. That's mm -hmm. just the, uh, the, the law of the land. Okay. Um, why do some people and companies refuse to hire unincorporated contractors? So if you've watched one of our other videos on contractors for employees, you know that all the risk you know, is, is when people hire unincorporated contractors. So 
when they hire unincorporated contractors, they're always worrying that that unincorporated contractor could be deemed their employee. And usually for that could make them uh, have to repay, um, you know, payroll remittances, you know, the tax, CPP, and EI that they should have deducted off that check and do so retroactively long after that contractor is gone. Um, also, you know, they can be, you know, deemed an employee for employment law purposes and then they're you know, entitled to vacation and severance pay and other employment benefits. Uh, like that. So, you know, in order to avoid that risk, they just take that blanket policy and say, hey, we're not going to, we're not going to hire unincorporated contractors. So, uh, so sometimes in order to get the, the job to begin with, you have to be incorporated. Also, there's a kind of a bit of a perception thing too. So even if it's not a hard no, but sometimes they just like, oh, this guy's not a, a real business. He doesn't even take the time to incorporate. So do I really want to do business with them? Uh, so there's a bit of a perception thing that, that can come into play, but you know, it comes down to sometimes you just won't get the job unless you're incorporated. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that case, do most unincorporated businesses go on to become successful businesses? Yeah. So my public practice career has been more than a decade now. The firm's been around for more than eight years. And we start going back to the history of our, our unincorporated businesses and which one really graduated from being an unincorporated business to a really successful business as opposed to ones that just said they jumped in with both feet from the day one and said i'm going to incorporate from day one how many of those you know became successful you know this has just become a a learning process for us that most people who do not incorporate they don't jump in with both feet they never really get that law of inertia going getting a business going at any scale it requires an tremendous amount of uh, effort mm -hmm. and if they don't jump in with both feet at some point and just take the plunge it never really happens uh, so really when you're uh, when you're not incorporating a business on the offset you're you're really saying that well a it's it's uh, I'm okay with the the, the risk the uh, that it's gonna be but B and probably more importantly is is you know this is more of a side hustle mm -hmm. than a business that I want to grow because you're you're kind of admitting to yourself that I'm not really gonna put in the, the required effort to get to uh, you know, uh, 50K a year where it becomes a no-brainer anyway. So, um, or to a point where I really care about the brand that I'm spending, I should be spending hours and hours to build. So, um, yeah, so uh, just anecdotally, we haven't seen a lot of success for business owners who, who I would say, you know, tiptoe into the water and do so as an unincorporated business. As the ones who tend to succeed are the ones who, who jump in with both feet and they, they, you know, exert that kind of effort to get, uh, you know, a business rolling, right? Which, which takes a lot of effort, so. So if you're looking for, uh, you know, if you if you want to take the islands, you got to burn the ships. Most businesses that are successful, you know, really just take the plunge and incorporate because they they they're kind of betting on success rather than betting on staying small. So I think that's what we have here today. Thanks again for uh, tuning in. Uh, you know, as always, if you hit the like like button or subscribe button, would be much appreciated. And if you have any questions, you know, please leave them in the comments below, and we'll do our best to address them in future videos. Thanks very much.